It appeared two weeks ago. A storm raged the night before, and the following morning it was there, taking up the entire middle of the West Valley and Jefferson intersection. A sinkhole that dropped so far no one could see how deep it went. There were no reports of any cracks forming prior to the ground opening up, and it was in the only corner of the country that didn't have any street cameras nearby. The discovery was called in around 6 a.m. by a contractor on his way to a job site. It was early and still raining, and he nearly drove right into the sinkhole. Within minutes, police officers and the fire department showed up and the intersection was taped off. They had no idea what caused it and couldn't figure out what to do about it. The sinkhole apparently just kept going, so they couldn't fill it up. No matter how many cement trucks they sent in, the intersection became this interesting local wonder that turned into national news. Government specialists arrived with drones, GPSs, and radio transmitters, and all kinds of sonar tech. Everything they sent would drop down, going deeper and deeper, until a certain depth, where they would all go offline and were never seen again. No one had any real answers for what was happening, or plans to fix it. There was talk about building an artificial bottom a few feet down, that they could equal off at street level so the intersection could continue as is. But it never got past the planning stage. It didn't have the chance. Less than a week later, something unthinkable happened. Small groups of people began amassing near the constructed barriers around the sinkhole. One person, an older lady, walked out, away from her group stepping over the edge and down into the abyss. She didn't scream or cry. She just went over and disappeared. There were gasps. A lone scream emerged as another person, this one, a teenage boy, followed the old woman's footsteps. Then another one followed him over, and then yet another. That day, close to a hundred people climbed the barrier and walked over the edge. Even some guards left their posts and went over themselves. Our government instituted both a quarantine and a curfew for the city. The perimeter around the sinkhole grew. But again, it had no effect. People found a way in. They were from all parts of the city and all walks of life. There was no separating the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the chaff. Whatever was happening, everyone was welcome. No one knew why people were doing it. But one afternoon while doom scrolling, I came across a video. It was from a cell phone and had gone viral. Normally, I wouldn't watch that type of thing, but I immediately recognized the subject. It was a woman named Helen. She was always pleasant, grateful, and enjoyable to be around. But watching her stand on the edge, she appeared to be a completely different person. It shook me to the core. Her expression hit a deep nerve in me. It was dark and visceral. She had a confused sadness like a veil had been pulled aside to reveal a choice she'd always had available, but had now lost all care or semblance of a future, other than stepping forward. And then, she did. I'd never seen someone die before, and was disturbed that the first time doing so was someone I helped carry groceries for at the supermarket near my apartment and knew on a first name basis. I haven't gone back to the supermarket, though it's now apparent that whatever's going on isn't transmissible. Either you were affected by it or you weren't. And over the next two weeks, the deaths rose and then dropped off. 
we all thought that was it. We referred to those who had walked over the edge as the fallers and tried to act like it was all some bizarre mass psychosis event. But they hadn't fallen. What they did was intentional and whatever was happening wasn't finished. A week later, another strange anomaly occurred. People began complaining about a vague ringing sound, like a train coming to station far off in the distance. Not everyone heard it, but within a week, everyone in the city knew at least five people who did, and the number was growing every day. I remember when my girlfriend, Laura, first heard it. I thought she was messing with me, but the more she talked about it, the more I believed her. She described it as a single note, one that was rising and decaying simultaneously, like it was always getting quieter and louder, softer and harsher. The longer it occurred, the more uneasy she felt. The note would fluctuate from almost imperceptible to being so loud it was like that distant train was now right beside her. Sometimes at night, she said it was excruciating. I started to wonder about the other people who heard it. Did they have the same experience? Was it better or worse? I couldn't imagine it being worse. Then I remembered Christian. He was a guy in my dorm in college who was afflicted by the suicide disease. It was actually named Fothergill's disease or trigeminal neuralgia. For him, it developed during first week, and by the end of the first year, Christian had dropped out. It was a condition that caused him insane amounts of unbearable pain in his face and temples caused by sensation flare-ups in the nerves. The suffering was so great that many who are gripped by it take their own lives to escape. I'm not sure if he did. I was hopeful that wasn't some version of what was happening to Laura and the others. But if it was, how far would people go? Does it have to do with the storm that erupted that night? It's funny thinking back. My girlfriend's religious mother had called us during the storm saying it felt biblical, and that was true. It did carry an apocalyptic vibe. I remember before the rain started, the air felt heavy. It wasn't just the humidity. It felt like gravity was shifting. Then it started to rain, droplets the size of golf balls. It continued through the night, around 3 a.m., a slight tremor rippled through the city. It was faint, but even if you were asleep, you felt it. I'd gone to the bathroom and was doom scrolling when it happened. It felt like the earth had convulsed, gagged and vomited up something it couldn't ingest. The tremble never repeated, and the rain continued until the following morning. Just after breakfast, the sun came out like it was the first day of summer. But watching the heavy curtains of rainwater pouring through the streets and gutters evoked thoughts of Noah. Wasn't there a Bible verse about the earth opening its mouth and swallowing us up? Maybe that's paraphrasing. It's been a while since I've cracked the old book. Could it be extraterrestrials if they were out there and planning a takeover? Having us all walk into a giant trash can in the ground is a pretty genius idea. It would be an easy way to clear the planet of a population. Was the sinkhole created by some weapon that plunged into our earth and sent out a resonance wave from the bottom that would be heard eventually by everyone and pull them down to its depths and to their death? It's frustrating listening to the talking heads on TV go on about it. They all sound sure of themselves, as do the scientists and experts that are supposedly fixing this. 
Calm breeds calm, I guess. I just wish people would be honest with the cold hard fact that we have no idea what's happening. And the longer it continues, the more I realize we probably never will. The history books may make something up to justify or explain, but it'll just be a guess. And that's assuming that there will still be people writing history books after this. Some scientists think it could be related to Earth's magnetic field for something completely invisible that can be detected by a compass needle and reaches thousands of miles into space. I'm shocked they are only thinking of it now. Could certain electric currents carry imperceptible sound waves that cause psychological influence, physical manipulation, and was there a way to block the wave? Everyone seemed to have more and more questions, always framed in a positive light, like they were actually answers bringing us closer to the end of this whole thing. And maybe they were right in the wrong way. This morning, I found Laura in the bathroom. She had large red stained bandages over both her ears. A pair of gory scissors sat in the blood splattered sink. She'd punctured both her eardrums. The sound had become too much. The hospital was filled with people who had similar ideas. Bloody bandages over destroyed ears. They were all trying to make the sound stop, but it didn't work. The first night back from the hospital, Laura couldn't sleep. She took a few Ambien, a pint of whiskey, and some Oxys, but nothing worked. She was curled up in the fetal position, holding her head at both sides. We both finally fell asleep, I think, but when I woke up, Laura was gone. We had a small pad and paper that she was using to communicate with me. She'd written down, I'm sorry, I can't take it. Love you forever. Cameras had been set up at the sinkhole to try and identify the people who were going over the edge. They used facial identifying software to determine the individual and contact the next of kin. I didn't want to wait. I had to go to a central control station on the outskirts of town to find out if she'd gone in. It took several hours as that morning was apparently busy. A few thousand people had gone over, and it was only getting worse. Then Laura's name and face came up on the monitor. She'd gone over. Just before dawn of that morning was what the surveillance report said. I was told I could put her picture up on the wall outside if I wanted. I decided against it. As I left, I walked past the thousands of photographs and visuals that plastered the makeshift memorial for the fallers. I'm glad I didn't ask for a photo. There was no room left and I would have had to cover someone else's. So many people. How did this happen? I searched for- So many people. How did this happen? I searched for answers again, thinking back to college. I remember a professor showing a video about anthill death spirals. It only occurred in certain types of army ants, but when a group would get separated from the main swarm, they'd lose the pheromone track, panic and follow one another's scent in a continuous rotating circle. Hundreds. Thousands, sometimes millions of ants would do this, until they'd all die of exhaustion. I heard sinkholes have appeared in New York, Hong Kong, and Moscow now. Was this the beginning of our final death spiral? Then the ringing trailed off, as did the deaths, and for the briefest of time, it seemed like it was all ending. But I saw them everywhere. Every morning, looking down into my mug of black coffee, I was putting cream in just to avoid the reminder during every sip. It didn't matter. 
I saw it in the blacks of people's eyes. The hubcaps of car wheels. The traffic lights that weren't lit. The sinkhole was every circle I came across, day and night. Then, the dream started. I'd always be walking with Laura, somewhere downtown, when the rain would start. Then the ground below us would shake. The building beside us would collapse. She'd run into the middle of the street, and I'd chase after her. Just as I was about to get to her, the cement under us crumbled away, and the intersection would collapse. We'd both fall, large chunks of cement crushing us as we reached out for each other. It was always at this point I realized I was dreaming, but I couldn't wake up. We'd just keep falling and Laura would be there, in pain, just out of reach. I heard people talk about falling in their dreams and how they always wake up before they land. I've always wondered why that is. Is it because since dreams are projections of our consciousness and we don't know what happens after death, our brains just don't know what to fill it with? The dreams have been spilling into my days. Each one feels longer. Every time I shut my eyes, the image of Laura crushed between two chunks of road cement is plastered across my lids and we're falling. The cement grinding her down as the light from the sky far above turns into a pinpoint. We continue to fall in the darkness. I can hear her screaming right next to me as we drop for eons through the unending void. My moments of waking calm are diminished by the day and I fear insanity is creeping up my shadow. A month out from the arrival of the sinkhole, something new and frightening happened. I had a waking nightmare. I was at the grocery store when all of the sudden, I was walking through downtown with Laura instead. She was smiling and happy, and the sun washed across her face like a painting. I didn't feel tired or anxious anymore. I felt like I'd just laid down in fresh sheets after a long day. I didn't even know where Laura was leading me. My eyes were locked on hers. Then I saw them. The black circles of her pupils. The sinkhole. And as if on cue, with my IDing of them, the sun overhead was gone. Rain droplets the size of golf balls were barraging the streets. Laura kept pulling me forward. Lightning streaked the sky in electric spider webs, and the thunder shook the earth, causing the road below us to ripple like a wave. The cement under Laura crumbled. I held her tight, but her grip slipped through mine, and she fell backwards. As Laura went over, she disappeared before she hit the darkness of the endless pit. I snapped back to reality from the waking nightmare and realized I was at the West Valley and Jefferson intersection. And I was about to step over the edge. <laughs>